Hello, I'm Job, and I want to explore and engage with ideas that we encounter in our daily journeys. That by engaging with these ideas, we are able to make more sense, hopefully, and find meaning in what life brings upon us in whether big moments or the mundane. For each video, I'll bring you along my exploration and engagement with these ideas through the Daisy method. Just like the daisy flower, the disc or that round part in the middle will carry the main idea. And the ray flowers, the ones popularized uh, by the game that we used to play when we were kids that she loves me or she loves me not, will carry the various stories, historical references, perspectives that will each contain a conclusion pointing back to the disc. The next few weeks will be very personal to me. These are ideas that I've been engaging with in my daily journey the moment I resigned from my 14-year job. The operative word is resign. That brings us to today's idea, liminal space. How do we make sense of it? It was 3.50 in the morning and I couldn't sleep. That was April 26, 2022. So I got my phone and thinking about a major leap that I was gonna take in my life. I wanted to message someone who knew most of my life, knew people I loved, and had a great impact in my life as well. I messaged my very first pastor, and I said, I wanted to let you know that I'm fully resigning today. And for 14 years, I was both a campus missionary and a youth pastor. Being the pastor that I worked with for the first two to three years in my journey, I felt like he was someone I could trust with this transition. His first reply was, I'll just put on my pods. You wanna call? At 3.52 in the morning, I went to the veranda and we talked until around 5 in the morning. I was relieved, yes, but he was also honest and kind enough to actually remind me this conversation was not the only conversation we were supposed to have in this transition. That there will be deeper things that we will have to talk about when I'm already in that phase. I didn't have much idea of what he was talking about until I entered the liminal space. In architecture, liminal spaces are the transitional areas that connect Two distinct functional spaces. The term liminal originates from the Latin word limen, which means threshold. These spaces exist as the boundary or threshold between two different areas. Liminal spaces serve as bridges between spaces, facilitating movement and transition. Now, they may lack definitive functions but can adapt to accommodate various activities. Examples would include corridors, stairways, lobbies, waiting areas, restrooms, and even sidewalks. In anthropology, liminality is a state of ambiguity or disorientation experienced during the middle stage of rituals. It is an ambiguous thing. Overall, liminal spaces in anthropology represent traditional phases where individuals navigate ambiguity and uncertainty, leading to transformative experiences and the establishment of new norms and practices within society. To make it more practical for us, liminal space would mean the roller coaster of excitement, then the next day, anxious. It's the need to figure out things right away, but you're still in the waiting game. It can feel very lonely in the liminal space. The real issue here now is uncertainty. So what now? In Necessary Endings, Henry Cloud emphasizes the importance of accepting and metabolizing grief during transitions. Using the example of Mogerkins, the CEO of Zondervan Publishers, who conducted a funeral-like ceremony to properly say goodbye to a company they had to shut down. This act allowed the employees to mourn the loss, to celebrate the past, and to preserve its memory before moving on to the next stage. Henry Cloud explains that when we invest emotional energy in something, ending it will have an impact. And if we don't address those feelings, will struggle to move forward. Grieving is essential because it involves facing the reality that something is over 
and allowing ourselves to feel the associated emotions. Unlike other emotions that keep us stuck, the feelings of grief have forward motion. It helps us let go and prepare for what's next. Henry Cloud warns against avoiding grief by rushing into something new out of necessity. There are people like that who are actually, instead of facing the grief, they just want to be excited for something new right away. This rebound behavior only delays the grieving process and may lead to poor decision making. Instead, Cloud actually suggests that treating endings with respect is a way better approach. But to acknowledge the significance of these events and to create space for healing. To take actions, Henry Cloud actually suggests that you and I can acknowledge the need to grieve, to recognize the significance of what's ending and allow ourselves to feel the associated emotions. To seek support, to lean on friends, family, or professionals for emotional support during the grieving process. To embrace the transition, to understand that necessary endings actually pave the way for new beginnings and for personal growth. I'm reminded of so many verses in the Bible that actually does not avoid the idea of grief and sadness and liminal space and things we go through transition, but at the same time giving us comfort in the Word of God. Ecclesiastes has something that speaks into the idea of seasons in life highlighting that there is a time for everything including a time to plant and a time to uproot a time to tear down and a time to build in one of the letters of paul to the philippi he actually encourages believers to forget what is behind and strain toward what is ahead pressing on toward the goal for the price of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. When someone writes that, it doesn't mean that that person is actually telling the other people to actually stop worrying, to stop going through the grieving process. But he only points out that there will come a time you will have to forget what is behind and strain toward what is ahead. In a way, it's acknowledging that there is a need to forget what is behind. In a way, it is acknowledging that it's actually difficult to strain toward what is ahead. In the Old Testament, Isaiah has a part where God speaks through the prophet and he declares that God is doing a new thing and he urges people to forget the former things and not dwell on the past. In a way, that's also acknowledging that people are susceptible to dwelling on the past. And it's really because maybe leaving the past behind takes a process. Psalms also have something about it. The psalmist declares in chapter 30 verse 5 that weeping may stay for the night, but rejoicing comes in the morning, suggesting that even in times of sorrow and loss, there is hope for a new dawn and fresh beginnings. So many people can actually just interpret this as something that communicates moving on right away. But for the Bible to actually cover these verses, to me, I see it as there is a God who actually acknowledges the process, the liminal space, the, the, the pains in transition. He made sure to have something about it in his written word. Yesterday, a perfect timing, someone just messaged me on Instagram, Job, I'm resigning. I had to ask how did he feel about it and how did his wife feel about it? And he said, we both decided on this together, but we're nervous. We're nervous about the uncertainty. And I said to him, having gone through this major transition myself, that it is God who has plans for you, not the organization, not the company that you're working for right now. So yes, it will be challenging, but you'll always go back to that truth. And maybe you're watching and you're a bit challenged and having a difficulty in your liminal space. Even the past is not your source of certainty. So this friend resigns soon. Welcome to uncertainty. One morning of June 1990, 
A timid young boy had it all blurry. He entered the school for the very first time in his life. His mom dropped him off and endorsed him to the teacher. Not knowing anyone, nothing ever registered to him at all on that day except that moment. He entered the school nervous. I was that boy. Around the same time, a woman was sitting on a delayed train from Manchester to London King's Cross in 1990. J.K. Rowling experienced a moment of inspiration that would change literary history forever. Harry Potter! The idea of a young wizard named Harry Potter popped into her mind and sparking the beginning of an extraordinary journey. But the story is not just about that. Because before she wrote the full series, she had to go through divorce, she had to be a single mom, and she had to battle through depression. So yes, it was one day in that train ride from Manchester to London, she got an idea for a story about a young wizard, but life was hard. And she felt lost and uncertain. If you read the biographies about JK Rowling, you would notice something very interesting. She sought for help. She sought for help and she also continued writing. Her decision to keep going in the liminal space not only helped her, but it also created one of the most love book series ever. It was summer of 2019. I was in a room in a really beautiful place called Wheaton, Illinois. My professor, Christina Walker at that time, was talking about liminal spaces. And she talked about what happens in the liminal space. Three things. Resistance becomes maturity. Number two, disorientation becomes comfort with paradox. And number three, pain becomes loving compassion. I was just actually at a cafe yesterday morning and finalizing this outline a new layer of grief was in a way unearthed. I was grieving the reality that I couldn't actually talk to my father about a major transition that I had to go through because he died before it. I was there in the coffee shop chatting with my wife, telling her that this is what I'm going through now. This, these are my thoughts. And then she would give one-liners that makes me want to weep. So I had to tell her, you know what, I'll just close this first because I cannot afford to cry like a baby here in a coffee shop. I realized that that's one of the saddest part of this major transition. I would have wanted to have that usual mundane conversation I have with him while I bring my kids to visit him in my brother's condominium. And we would have those just small talks. In a way, he gets updates about my life. And I would have wanted to have that moment of telling him that I've transitioned and that I'm very sure about it, but it's full of uncertainty. And that's a layer in the grieving process when I am in a liminal space. How does that look like to you? Do I regret entering the liminal space? As if it can totally be prevented, right? But to be honest, I don't regret anything. I would much rather be in a liminal space, go through grief and uncertainty, and feel so many things, if only to cling to the main driver of my life's purpose. Todd Henry, in his podcast, The Daily Creative, once asked, what if the biggest barrier to making the brave decision isn't that you think too little of what you don't yet have, it's that you think too highly of what you have right now. Maybe the things you're clinging to aren't worthy nearly as much as you think they are, and you just don't know it yet. So for the past minutes, we've basically gone through five petals in our daisy flower. We defined the liminal space, and it serves as a transitional zone, bridging distinct areas, facilitating movement and transformation in both physical and societal context. We talked about grief. Embracing grief during transitions is essential for growth, clarity, and resilience, while avoiding it can lead to stagnation and poor decision-making. Biblical passages highlight the cyclical nature of life, encouraging perseverance and trust in God's ability to bring about new beginnings amidst uncertainty. 
And we found out that asking for help during your liminal space might actually be very good for you. And finally, while I'm in the state of liminal space also, navigating liminal spaces involves traversing uncertainty, grieving losses, and embracing growth to foster deeper self-awareness and resilience as well. The key word is being here, not rushing out of it just because people are telling you to be resilient, but just being here and knowing that in your here, someone's there. For me, my God is here willing to sit with me. So as a way of reflecting from this video, I'd like to ask you three questions. How are you currently navigating your liminal space? How are you processing losses or transitions in this liminal space? And finally, how can you embrace uncertainty and not be isolated for a long time? Is there someone you can run to? Will therapy help? Will having a counselor help? Will having a spiritual director help? How can you embrace uncertainty and not end up being isolated? So I hope this exploration and engaging with the idea of liminal space helps you to go through your own uncertainties in your daily journey. Till the next idea as we journey along.